to celebrating our food and telling stories of it. I am Sophie, your host and producer, and this is Our Food Stories, a podcast for us and by us. Episode 28. How many leafy greens can you name? Last year, I was having a conversation with a fellow food enthusiast, and I was sharing my frustration at how what is known as local vegetables or greens are globally simplified into just African spinach. This story and many others from this podcast are evidence that there is such a wide variety of leafy greens. In today's story, special guest Innocent Achan shares her recollection of osobi, a sauce made with cow pea leaves and jute mallow. She also talks about the dish's significance in her life. Enjoy. I didn't see my mother in the kitchen often when I was growing up. She was a busy single mother of three and a magistrate at that, receiving postings that took her all over and sometimes out of the country, as far away as Gulu and Moyo and sometimes Mbarara. So most of my kitchen needs as a child fell to my aunts, my older cousins and the house helps we had. But the few times I experienced her culinary skills are forever stamped in my mind. Once, I was having a friend over, and I wanted them to experience my Madi and Lubara heritage through our food. After all, what better way is there to show a friend your culture than through your food? So, I asked my mother to help me cook osobi. Osobi is a sauce made of cowpea leaves, groundnut and or simsim paste, and a herb called angoronya, known in some places as jute mallow or bush okra. From as far back as I can remember, osobi has been one of my favorite meals. It is quick and easy to cook and tastes like absolute heaven when eaten with boiled sweet potatoes. All over the northern and northwestern parts of the country, it is considered a delicacy and known by different names. The Lubara and Madi people call it Osobi, while further to the east, the Teso people call it Ebo. The Acholi, who admittedly are responsible for most of the popularity of the sauce, call it Bo. In fact, all over the country, the most popular name for the sauce is Bo. On the other hand, their Langi cousins call it Boyo. In Uganda, a region that has become a melting pot for the many cultures of Uganda, the leaves are known as gobe. These days, it is difficult to walk into a restaurant specializing in local cuisine and find that they do not offer osobi or bo on their menu. The sauce has long been a favorite among not only people from the north, but also people from other parts of the country. It is also an excellent option for people with alternative dietary lifestyles like vegetarianism and veganism. It is for this reason that I was excited to share it with my dear friend who was visiting the country for the first time. Before we could begin cooking, I had to make a run to the market to buy the ingredients we would use. If you want to make osobi at home, you can find all the ingredients you will need in your local market. You will need the following items. A quarter kilogram of cowpea leaves, which the market ladies will likely recognize more easily if you call it bo or gobi. A half kilogram of groundnut paste, commonly referred to as odi, idi, or chipoli. You have to be careful to specify whether you want plain groundnut paste or a mixture of groundnut paste mixed with simsim or sesame paste. You will also need a small bunch of angoronya or jute mallow, although the herb may be hard to find in some parts. 
In these cases, you can substitute it with four chopped pods of okra or lady's finger. Next, you'll need a tablespoon of rock salt, commonly known as magadi. You will also need a tablespoon of table salt. You'll also need to have two cooking pots or saucepans on hand and two cups of water. When it comes to cooking traditional food, my mother prefers to go the traditional route in all aspects. She would have preferred to make the osobi in a firewood oven like the ones we had in Ajumani, but since we didn't have one available in our wakiso home, she settled for a charcoal stove. A modern stove, gas or electric, will work just as well as a charcoal stove, but I can never say that to her face. When the charcoal stove was lit and ready for use, she set a pot on it and poured two cups of water into it to boil. As the water started to boil, she chopped up the fresh cowpea leaves into bite-sized pieces. She gave them a thorough rinse and set them aside in a colander to let the excess water drain off. You have to be careful to wash your leaves as thoroughly as possible. Interrupting your listening for a little bit. Did you know that you can send in your food story? Yes, that's right. If listening to this podcast has inspired you to relieve some of your favorite food memories, you can send those stories and be part of our food stories. Just send an email to a kitchen in Uganda at gmail.com to get more details. This call is for Ugandans for now. But if you enjoy these stories as much as we have enjoyed bringing them to you, you can leave a testimonial or a rating on your favorite listening platforms. Now back to the story. Or you might find yourself biting into bits of rock and soil since the plant grows so close to the ground and that cannot be pleasant. Next, she added the rock salt to the boiling water. At this point, she let me in on an old trick she would use when she ran out of rock salt in the village. Instead, she would make and use what she called a inaka. It was a mixture made from the ash of burnt sweet potato peels and water. The mixture would be allowed to dry in the sun and the powder would be used for cooking. After the rock salt was added, she let the water boil for another five minutes. Then she took the chopped cowpea leaves and added them to the water. She also added the angurunya, which would give the sauce its characteristic thick, slippery nature. If you don't have angurunya, this is when you add the four pods of okra chopped into tiny pieces. Okra will also give your sauce that thick, slippery consistency. The mixture was allowed to cook for 15 minutes, during which time she kept checking to see if the leaves were soft enough yet. Also, by looking at the color of the water, she could tell whether or not the leaves were ready yet. If the water was still clear and colorless, the leaves weren't ready yet and would need more time to boil. This was also usually a sign that you needed a little more rock salt. Once the water took on a yellowish hue, the leaves were cooked to perfection and you could take them off the stove. She took the pot off the stove and transferred its contents to another pot. With a ladle, she scooped some of the water from the boiled cowpea leaves into the first pot. Then, she poured the groundnut sauce into this water, stirring with a mingling stick as she poured. This entire process took place off the stove. Once the mixture had a smooth consistency, she put it aside. She then set the second pot with the boiled cowpea leaves back on the stove and added the groundnut paste mixture to the leaves while stirring slowly. This would ensure that the consistency of the sauce remained smooth with no lumps of groundnut paste. When the sauce started to boil, she took the stove off the pot again to lower the heat in the stove. Now, if we had used a gas stove or an electric stove, a quick turn of a knob 
would have sufficed. But because we were using a charcoal stove, she had to take out a few embers from the stove to lower the heat. She set the pot back on the stove and allowed the sauce to simmer for another 15 minutes. Then she added the table salt to the sauce, stirred it once more and took it down from the stove. Now the sauce was ready to eat. We would have it with boiled sweet potatoes that we had prepared earlier in the day. In the village, people will eat osobi with millet bread or corn bread or even cassava bread. However, sweet potatoes, cassava and rice are great alternatives. Some people prefer to use a mixture of simsim paste and groundnut paste to make their osobi. In such cases, you can use a quarter a kilogram of groundnut paste with a quarter a kilogram of simsim paste to make the perfect bittersweet ratio. Others prefer to use groundnut paste alone and others prefer to use simsim paste alone. However, be warned that the simsim paste alone can be a little bitter on the palate. Other people like to add pieces of smoked fish or smoked beef with the bones carefully removed, of course, to the sauce. It's a fantastic way to add flavor to the meal, but remember that this means the meal is no longer vegetarian. Altogether, it took us less than an hour to make our sauce. Osobi is a healthy and affordable meal for both beginner and veteran cooks looking to expand their palates. These days, when I'm feeling nostalgic about the tastes and smells of home, a quick nip to the market and a short trip to the kitchen are all it takes to transport me to the land of my ancestors. Remember to have your osobi with a glass of water on hand because it can be quite the heavy meal, but delicious nonetheless. <music> Thank you, Innocent, for this lovely recollection and for sharing the story of Osobi with us. Innocent is a medical doctor and a writer. I am not ashamed to admit that I have quite a number of screenshots of Innocent's writing in my phone. And this is because she is excellent at weaving and painting with words. And I think we all had this reflected in this story of Osobi. You can connect with Innocent on Twitter under the name at I underscore I underscore Achan. Remember, if you have a delicious food story that is very dear to your heart and you would like to share it on this podcast, you can reach out to me via email at a kitchen in Uganda at gmail.com or on Instagram at a kitchen in Uganda. Don't forget to share the podcast with other listeners to leave a review or a rating and to comment on your favorite stories wherever you listen. See you in the next episode.